have that? No, no. You can do it for the MCA. Yeah, oh. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وعلى اله واصحابه ومن والاه ثم ما بعد so before we begin for today's uh, Friday night program there's a very crucial question i need to ask the question is <laughs> no the question is that would you guys want to have dinner before Isha Iqama or after Isha Salah? The easier option is after Isha because it can give us a little bit more time but I have been told by the brothers to ask the people. So, what is the response? Okay, how about right now? How about right now? After Asha, okay, khalas inshallah. That actually gives me a bit more time because the topic. Like yeah. people, they're going to say it. They're going to say it. Tayyib, inshallah. So we'll have Isha uh, Salah and then we'll have dinner right after that, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. okay, so let us begin for today's topic. You might have seen the flyer. The topic for today, inshallah, is coping with stress and anxiety from the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As you may be aware, we are currently in the month of Rabi' al Awwal. Right? Okay. So, before I dive in much deeper to the topic, how many of you guys, at least at some level or some place, have studied the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Whether it may be a lecture, or whether it may be a series, whether it may be a book. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Alright, inshallah. So, for those of us who have studied the seerah, alhamdulillah, two thumbs up. For those of us who haven't, please try your very best to make an effort, uh, inshallah ta'ala, to at least have one run through of the full seerah from the Prophet's birth all the way up until his uh, demise in the 10th year of the hijrah. Because as a ummati of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. It is very, very important for us that if we claim that we are, you know, the people of the Muhammad Sallallahu we are like Ashik or Rasul kind of, you know, that we should have at least some basic knowledge and understanding of the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu because this is something that will help us to go by in our daily lives as well, right? Because we can all agree that the best teacher, the best husband, the best father, the best uh, military commander, the best leader in his community, and the best person in trade, the best person in everything of his time was Prophet Muhammad So that is why it is very important for those of us who have not uh, studied the seerah, please try and make your best effort inshallah ta'ala. So, now when we talk about the seerah, especially, so basically, there's two types of studying the seerah, two different ways to study it. Obviously, the most uh, you know contemporary way and the most uh, classical way of studying the seerah is that you go uh, year by year and you go by the lesson by lesson and you go by incident by incident, right? But inshallah ta'ala, today we will be doing a different type of studying, a different type of uh, what you would call a series, a lecture, which is to study the seerah by via motif or by via a different type of lens. As many of you may be aware, in the past I've done the story of Yusuf through the lens of a young mind, right? So that was also a via motif study of the story of Yusuf So today we're looking at the seerah of the Prophet through the lens of stress and anxiety, right? Now, obviously, I can say that each and every single one of us, at least the adults can say this, 
that we have all been through some type of stress, through some type of anxiety, through some type of what you would call like a day in which you maybe are feeling negative or maybe you're feeling down in this dunya. That you feel like that, you know, this dunya is not worth for you or something like that, right? Well, the fact of the matter is that these emotions are natural, right? And obviously that is actually something which is, you know, it's natural and it is a part of our human nature. That sometimes things happen, sometimes some events happen. And we tend to basically go through stress, go through anxiety, go through depression, and we have this type of feeling. Now, inshallah ta'ala, there are basically five major points which I will be going over for today's uh, lecture, inshallah. If someone would like to write them down for themselves, that, that, that's perfectly fine, inshallah. I will, I will be dictating for that sake, inshallah. So let us begin for today, inshallah ta'ala. So lessons from the seerah, practical lessons from the seerah, especially with dealing with stress and anxiety. The first quote, bullet point is, and this is again lesson from the seerah, the seerah teaches us that life is going to be full of problems regardless of our piety and faith. So within this first point, we might think that, you know, if someone is maybe, he has very high iman, then he's supposed to have, you know, a very luxurious life, a very easy life, you know, because he's worshipping Allah all the time, right? But subhanAllah, the weird part is, and again, this is something which we learn from the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that even if we study his life, and for those of us who have studied his life, that his life is full of problems, it's full of trials, it's full of, you know, like sad incidents, one after the other. It is something very clear to us that the Prophet ﷺ went through a lot, right? Very quickly, if we begin from when he was born, he was born without a father, meaning his father passed away before he was even born. So he was born an orphan, right? And then when he's born, by the age of six years old, his mother passes away, right? Then he goes to his grandfather, then his grandfather passes away when he's eight years old. And he's living with his uncle Abu Talib until he becomes of the age of what you would call getting married and being an adult. That is when pretty much, you know, he then just started living on his own by then. So the, the best example that can be given from this, obviously the Prophet's life was full of problems. And for those of us who may be going through some type of problem, maybe we have some type of financial problem, family problem, uh, you know, maybe we have some other problems that we are going through. We should remember that for those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he loves, He actually tests them. He gives them a musibah. If he, test, if he loves them, He gives them a test. And if He loves them more, He gives them more tests. So remember this point. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, then you will be tested more than any other person, right? So, there, the main examples that can be given is that when the Prophet sallallahu began his da'wah in Mecca, obviously the first three years were the secret da'wah, and then after that, he began to do the public da'wah. And now when he's doing his public da'wah, he went through so many various types of difficulties. The, the main example that can be given is how uh, Abu Lahab actually humiliated him in front of the whole people when he was calling out to them and saying that, you know, it is time, my people, that I am telling you that the adab of Allah is coming and the fire of Jahannam is real and the day of judgment is coming, so believe in me and also believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abolish all of these faith, uh, false gods that you have and basically come towards me and accept this message. That is when Abu Lahab, he began to throw that sand and dust upon him. And that is where Surah Lahab was also revealed later on. Another example is that after the Prophet ﷺ went through the, the year of sorrow, Aam al huzn in which he lost his uncle and his wife Khadija anha, Then after that, he lost his protection. He lost his aman, right? So because he lost that, right, he wasn't pretty much able to live in Mecca because there was no one protecting him. So if, if he would do or give any da'wah, 
then he, he, if, he was uh, if he was persecuted, then no one would pretty much save him. So that is why he went to Ta'if. Now Ta'if is pretty much on the, it's like a suburb of Mecca. It's kind of like maybe half an hour to maybe one hour in, in today's day. And you can literally even go today from Mecca. If you drive out, you can go to Ta'if. So that is where the Prophet ﷺ went. And again, this hadith is in Bukhari. The, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he was questioned by Aisha radiallahu anha. And she was the one who asked him that, Ya Rasulullah wasallam, was there ever a day more harder for you, more harsh for you, more traumatizing for you, more stressful for you, more anxious for you, than, than the day of Uhud? Because for her, Aisha radiallahu anha, she thought that the day of Uhud was very you know, stressful, it was traumatizing, it was pretty much like a very testful day. But the Prophet وسلم, he told her and he said, La ya Aisha, no, for me the day of Ta'if, it was very, very painful and stressful. Because he went with his, uh, his slave Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. And so when they went to Ta'if, and obviously they were cut with stones on their way coming back, then that is where the Prophet wasallam immediately, he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said that, Allahumma inni ashku da'fi, that he was confessing of his own weakness. And he made a very long dua, right? And pretty much the gist of it is, is that, you know, if you basically forsake me, then there is no one for me, that, you know, you are the only one who, can I, who I can look up to. And that is when... Jibreel came down and he said, you know, the angel of the mountains is here and he's just, you know, waiting for your command. Just give us a command and we will, you know, basically smash this whole, these whole people of Ta'ala. So, and that is where the Prophet wasallam, even though he went through a lot of stress, right? He went through a lot of trauma. Imagine, think. Imagine, for example, that we went to over here to downtown Matachin or downtown Fords and we have a Dawa table and suddenly people come and they start, you know, basically throwing stones upon us and they're basically harassing us and doing a lot of violence. Obviously going you know, through the whole government system and the legal system, that's different. But I'm talking about as a human being. Would any one of us even think about forgiving those people just for the sake of that, just for the sake that they will accept Islam? It's a very tough question to answer. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in Surah Anbiya, that, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have not sent you, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except as a mercy for the worlds. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not a mercy just for the people of Thaif. He was not a mercy for the people of, you know, the Arabian Peninsula. He was a mercy for every single one, not just in this world, but alam. It means even everywhere else. He was a mercy for everyone. And so, obviously, the day of Ta'if was very, you know, hard and cumbersome. And it was a very difficult day for Rasulullah wasallam. And that is why after that, the incident of Isra and Ma'raj came to boost the Prophet wasallam's morale. To basically tell him that, you know what? It's fine that these things happen, but here you are. You're leading the prophets in prayer, which no one, no other prophet has actually done before, right? So another point to mention is the burying of the Prophet ﷺ on six children. So obviously he had seven children, but obviously within his own lifetime, he buried six of them, right? And so one, of the, one after the other, obviously his daughter was married to Uthman and Ruqayya and Umay Kulthum, both of them passed away. And then Zainab, his, his, his eldest daughter, she also passed away. And then there were his sons in, in Mecca, the, uh, one of them. And then also later on in Medina, he had another son called Ibrahim. His name was Ibrahim. And he passed away around the age of maybe two or maybe like two and a half. And pretty much he had the disease of asthma. And now within this disease, he wouldn't be able to breathe properly. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he basically was holding him. And Ibrahim, his son, he actually passed away in his own hands, the Prophet ﷺ. And then he began to cry. And obviously, who would not cry? If you are a father of a child, if you're a father of any boy, and he passes away in your, in your lap, you will be crying. You will be ex expressing some type of grief or sadness, right? And so, this leads me to actually the second point, which is that the Sira teaches us that feeling anxious or sad 
or hurt is not from the weakness of Iman and Taqwa. Right? So when this incident takes place, where the Prophet ﷺ is crying, one of the Sahabi, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked him, that at the Bikika, Ya Rasulullah, you cry, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ? And he said, yes, I do cry, because it's a natural thing. Because I have gone through grief, and this is something which is a response to grief. And so this tells us that if we are going through various issues in our life, right? And if we're maybe just in our bedroom alone and we're crying, it's, it's something natural. It's not something to be ashamed of, right? Now, obviously, this also tells us that, again, it's human nature to cry, number one. Number two, the other point to, to mention is that if someone is crying, we shouldn't pretty much be, you know, making fun of them or making fun of their iman or their trust in Allah. Because when you are crying, it may be, sometimes it happens, some people they cry out of joy. As they say, tears of joy. So, so some people are crying. But that doesn't have to do by saying that, you know, this person, he is, he has some type of weak iman. Or his taqwa is weak, or something like that. Iman is something different. It's not pretty much fully, fully like related to crying. When you're, respond, you're giving a response to something, which is like a grievance or like an event like that. So that is one other difference. Now... Another point to mention, this comes under the first point that life is going to be full of problems. It is that when we came to this dunya, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in Surah Al-Kabood, He says that, Alif Lam Meem, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا He says that, does mankind think, do they believe or perceive that أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا That they will just say that we believe, we believe. وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ And that we will not be testing them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions further and He says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ That we had actually tested the people before them to check which one of them, so that we will get to know which one of them are truthful and which one of them are actually lying. Right? So this comes to tell us that in this dunya, we will be going through phases in our lives in which we are tested, right? For some people, their test, simply as it's, as it's put, is diabetes. Maybe the guy has type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, he has to maybe take an insulin or something like that. That's a test for him, right? For some other people, it may be something else. So the fact of the matter is, is that our life is going to have different types of problems, right? But... Over here there's a deeper point, a deeper meaning. That if we are faced with these tests, how do we react to those tests? Are we going to just, you know, start a subhanahu wa blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the test? And basically, you know, stop being a good, uh, proper Muslim by stop praying or stopping other things? Or are we going to man up and take the challenge and say, hey, you know what? This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me pray to the of Salat al Hajj. Let me ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to try to alleviate this pain to help me, right? Now, obviously, for some of us who are like school going kids or in high school or college, when you have an exam in your school or in, in college, right? Obviously, you have to prepare for the exam, you have to study, right? But if you're also praying Salatul Hajjah, if you also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you and bless you in, in the exam, then this is also another way to deal with this type of stress, right? Because obviously before the exam, everyone is stressed out. Maybe some people did do their proper studying. Maybe some people, they pulled an all-nighter, you know, they were drinking coffee from some, from some place. Maybe Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, whatever they love the coffee from. So they're, they're drinking the coffee just to pull an all-nighter, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that this dunya is actually a testing ground, right? For those of us who have been in an examination hall, right? We know that in an examination hall, we don't think to be there long term. We just, we're just there maybe for one hour, two hours, maybe three hours. We, we go in there, we take the exam, and then we get out, right? So this dunya is a similar place for us. This is our examination hall. But the difference is that over here, for some people, their exam is 30 years. Some people, their exam is 60 years. For some people, their exam is 80 years, right? 
But everyone is being tested in their own way. So that is something which is also very, very important. Now, the second point that I had mentioned that the zero teaches us that feeling anxious or sad or hurt is not from the weakness of Iman and Taqwa. Now some examples from the zero of the Prophet are the martyrdom of Zayd ibn Hadith in the battle of Mu'tam. Now, for those of us who have said this year, Alhamdulillah, in which year of the Hijrah did the Battle of, the, of Mu'tah take place? Does anyone know? Battle of Mu'tah. Which year of the Hijrah? Battle of Mu'tah was against the Romans. It was after the conquest of Mecca. That's the best hint that I can give. If you know when the conquest of Mecca happened, then you should know when the Battle of Mu'tah happened. Yes, anybody? No one? Khair, inshallah. It was the eighth year of the Hijrah. So remember this, okay? In the sixth year of the Hijrah, the treaty of Hudaybiyah, Sulah Hudaybiyah is signed, okay? Then in the seventh year, it, it is known as the Amun Wufud or the year delegations. So the Prophet ﷺ, he sent a lot of emissaries around Arabia to Egypt, Bahrain, all of these places. In the eighth year of the Hijrah, the Quraysh, they had an alliance with Banu Bakr, okay? Banu Bakr is a tribe, it's also a polytheistic tribe. They had an alliance with the Quraysh and the Muslims, they had an alliance with Banu Khuza'ah, okay? So Banu Khuza'ah, they were gathered around one of their camping grounds and they were, you know, most likely reading some Quran. And suddenly the Banu Bakr, they were the ones who attacked the Banu Khuza'ah. Now the deal was in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that there will be no war for 10 years and if either party attacks the other, then what's going to happen? The Treaty of Hudaybiyah will dissolve. So exactly that's what happened. It, this happened during the 7th year, late 7th uh, year of the Hijrah, closer to the 8th year of the Hijrah. And that is where then the Congress of Mecca happened. After the Congress of Mecca happened and Qunayn happened and then the, the Muslims came back to Medina, then the Prophet وسلم, he sent an army towards the Roman area around Syria and Sham and a bit more closer to there. And that is where Zayd ibn Haritha, he was there. He went with the army. And in this army there was also Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And there was also Ja'far, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. He also got martyred in this, um, in this battle. right? And Khalid ibn al-Walid, he also went there. But he was not a commander, but this was pretty much his first battle right after taking Shahada, um, pretty much after the, the seventh year of the Hijrah. Okay? So I need to give some type of details just so that it's better to understand. So, so when the Battle of Morfia was taking place, Jibrayn he came to the Prophet and he was giving him like a live stream or you know something of that sort in which the Prophet was able to see what is happening uh, in the Battle of Mu'tah, right? And exactly he got to see how uh, Zayd ibn Haditha was martyred in that battle, right? Just to give some context, the Roman Empire, and especially within this Battle of Mu'tah, you could perceive them as being the superpower of the times, okay? So during this time of like, you know, the 506 year, 600 AD, the Romans and the Persians, these were the two known superpowers at the time. So when the Muslims went to attack over there, it was pretty much a statement that, you know, at this time we have progressed so much that we have this power. So that is why we are going to attack and basically launch this attempt to basically give down over there. And that is why the Romans were shot. And that is why obviously their army is pretty big. It's maybe even more than 10,000 people. So that is why they attacked. So when Zayd was martyred, in this uh, battle, the Prophet وسلم, again he began to cry, and he, he basically he was standing before, and then he just sat down, right? So again, this is something which comes to tell us that you know, it's something natural. Now, Zayd ibn Haritha, he's not some you know ordinary Sahabi, right? He's a very special Sahabi. He was with the Prophet وسلم, since his time in Mecca, right? He's, he was with him and he was his, uh, what you would call, companion towards Saif, right? 
And it was his son, he was the Prophet he named him Usam. Usam ibn Zayd is the, the son of Zayd ibn Harith, right? So this is no ordinary man. And obviously when he has passed away, the Prophet is trying to take a moment and process all of this type of information and all of this type of grief and sadness. That you know, he lost someone who was so close to him, right? So that is one incident, right? Now the other incident was where the Prophet ﷺ, when he was going through his marital issues, this is not about the event of if, this is a separate event in which Surah Tahrim was revealed. That this was where the wives of the Prophet ﷺ was um, basically Aisha and Hafsa anha. Both of them, they told the Prophet ﷺ to stop eating the honey which he would eat from Maymuna anha. And that is where he was. He spent one full month in the masjid, right? So this was a very tough time for him. That he was feeling anxious. He's not pretty much able to go back to his house. And this is where uh, he was actually sleeping in. There was a small room, like an attic kind of area, in the masjid of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was sleeping there for the full month. And this is where that famous incident happens, which many of us have maybe heard. Where Umar he came and he told the Prophet that Ya Rasulullah, the kings of Persia, the kings of Rome, they have various types of beds, you know. And here you are, you are the leader of all of all of us, of all, all the Muslims, and you're sleeping, you know, on a very like basically small sheet that you have over here. It's not even a mattress. And so, you know, that is where the Prophet he was pretty much telling him that, you know, this is how I want to live because for me, the Akhara is something that I desire. I don't desire this life. So this is pretty much where that incident happened, right? Now, a small tangent to go in here. For those of us who are married, we can say that in our marriages, sometimes things come up, right? Sometimes some problems come up. Right? Is that true or no? Yes. <laughs> but for those of us who are not married, right, who are single and they perceive marriage as maybe some type of fairy tale, some type of happily ever after, obviously for if you write if you find the right spouse, it will be the happily ever after. There's no denying that. But the thing is that marriage is something which is kind of like a roller coaster that we have in our lives. Right? There's going to be some highs, some lows. But if you have more highs than your lows, then alhamdulillah, that means your marriage is in a net positive. Alhamdulillah. Right? So, even the Prophet wasallam, he went through marital issues. He had, you know, he just didn't go through, um, there were some issues that he went through. And that is why, in the end, he was sitting in the masjid, and then, you know, that is where the Quran was revealed. For those of us who, alhamdulillah, have studied the seerah, the event of ifk, the slander against Aisha anha, it was a very big issue, right? And during that full time, almost about a month or two, Aisha anha, she spent that time living with her father, Abu Bakr anha, right? For her, that's her stressful situation, right? And in the various narrations that we find from the seerah of Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hajar and others, it's mentioned that she didn't really you know, come into society because she had a fever for that full month and then the Prophet ﷺ, he would just come in and he would just say salam and just you know, go out. But he wouldn't really stay and talk. And that is why she was confused at that time, right? And so later on when she got to know, then she went back to her parents' house and obviously she was crying, she was weeping, everyone would cry because the slander that was made, especially by the hypocrites, it was something very huge, which the Quran mentions as Subhanaka hadha buhtanun azim. That glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a very big type of slander. And you're accusing the wife of the Prophet of doing something which is you know highly immoral. So this comes to tell us that you know everyone goes through stressful situations, right? But the best people are those who use those situations as a launch pad to get more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Like for those of us who may be um, iPhone fanatics, you might know that recently the latest iOS 17 came out, right? And maybe some of you might have even downloaded it. So an iPhone update is something similar to us, meaning 
in our lives, we have a life update, right? That these, these types of uh, financial problems or other problems, family problems, other problems that come in our lives, they are an, an Iman update for us, right? That our Iman gets checked, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is checking. Is this person really faithful to me? Or is he just saying all these things, right? So obviously all of these events, they come to tell us that, you know, this life is temporary, number one. Number two, that the Sira is teaching us that when, when we go through all of these events of stress and that we go through anxiety, we actually get to know that this is not a perfect world. It's not a utopian society, right? There was a, one brother, he actually went to Turkey when the earthquake happened in Turkey and he met uh, one person who was actually an engineer and he was originally from Syria, from al -Sham. And this brother, he's married, he has you know, a couple of kids. So he had lost everything, whatever he owned, all of his money, three times. Let that sink in. He lost all of his money, his wealth, all of his gadgets, whatever he had, three times, right? He said that he was in Syria before when the attacks happened over there, like the civil war and unrest. He then moved out and then he was in Syria and then he came to Turkey. When he came to Turkey, he drove a taxi for 10 years, built a life, and then suddenly the earthquake happened in Turkey, right? Now, this brother who met him, who went from, from the US, he asked him that, you know, SubhanAllah, you've been through a lot, you lost all of your wealth three times. And here you are living in these small tents in this refugee camp. How do you think that you will, you, you know, pretty much uh, come back, like bounce back financially? And, you know, the answer that he gave, this is something which actually speaks wonders to all of us living here, right? For those of us living here in the U.S., we can pretty much say, and again, there's no shame in saying this, that our lives are very easy compared to others, by and large. We live very comfortable and alhamdulillah, easy lives, right? We can consider to be, and it can be said, that we can consider ourselves to be the top 1% around the globe. Why? It's because, alhamdulillah, we have peace, we have aman, there's security, right? We have food. SubhanAllah, there's so much food that we're gonna have, right? No one who's gonna leave here tonight will go on an empty stomach, except if they choose to, that's something else. But obviously there is food, right? And there's safety. And obviously the other thing that can be mentioned here is that it's not something that, you know, we, have, we don't have any like bare necessities. Alhamdulillah, everyone has clothes, everyone has a car, everyone has some type of transportation. But this person, right, who's there in, in, in Turkey at this time, obviously he's doing, he's uh, displaying a lot of sabr, right? He's, he's displaying a lot of patience. Do you think that the person who is a multimillionaire, who has, you know, the biggest penthouses in New York City or Jersey City or Beverly Hills and has, you know, maybe seven, eight cars and has a bank balance of, you know, five million dollars, do you think he's going to have the same ranks in Jannah as this person who lost his all of his wealth three times, right? And now he's living in a refugee tent and pretty much that is what their day-to-day -day is, right? Do you even think that? SubhanAllah, no. Obviously his ranks will be much more higher in Jannah, right? So then the brother asked him and the answer that he gave was that, you know what? When I lost all of my things, the first time, the second time, and even the third time, I never lost hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? It's because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَاقُ ذُو الْقُوَةِ الْمَتِينَ That indeed, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the sole provider, and He is the one who gives sustenance to all of His people. So this is a response coming from someone who lost all of his wealth, he lost his taxi, he lost whatever you know, type of property he was living in, he lost every single thing, right? Now, this comes to tell us that obviously, you know, he is someone who will be in the highest ranks of Jannah, right? Obviously, getting into Jannah is easy, right? You just need to make sure that you stick to the basic five pillars, you're praying, you're fasting, you make Hajj, if, if you are able to do it, you give Zakat if it's legible, if, if you'd have to do it, and pretty much staying away from all of the major sins, and whatever minor sins you have, you make tawbah, and that's pretty much it. You're getting into Jannah. But getting into the higher palaces of Jannah, right? The higher penthouses of Jannah, 
in which your plot will be next to the Prophet or next to all of the Anbiya and the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada and the Salihin, right? Obviously, we all want to be there. That is like the elite of the elite. People over here sometimes they mention about, you know, New York City, Jersey City, like the penthouses in like Beverly Hills, LA, San Francisco. SubhanAllah, why would we care about these places when you can have a penthouse next to the Prophet in Jannah? Everybody's going to be racing for that place, I'm telling you. Even when we get to Jannah, for those people, so obviously I'm not sure if you know, we all are aware, but in Jannah there's going to be multiple levels, right? Now for those people who just did the bare minimum in the dunya, they'll just get into like the bare minimum of Jannah, right? Maybe level 1 of Jannah, level 2 of Jannah, right? But for those people who have been through so many calamities, so many different types of trials and trests and tribulations and test after test, they will be in the highest rank of Jannah, which is Jannah for Firdaus, right? In Jannah for Firdaus, even all their various types of bounties are on another level, right? So that is where everyone would desire to go. Because in Jannah for Firdaus, you can meet the Prophet of the Sunnah many times. You're basically going up to him, you know, you're there, you're, you know, there and, and meeting other people as well, other Prophets as well. So that is the main reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tests and He's giving us all these things to basically tell us that, you know, this dunya is temporary, so work hard for the Akhirah because you want to get into Jannah for those. Now, the third point to mention in this uh, lesson from the Seerah is that the Seerah teaches us that Iman will help you to cope with tragedy, right? The mu'min has to have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the beginning I spoke about having problems, and then after that the second point was pretty much about how we have uh, you know, different types of stress and grief, and that it is okay to feel sad, it is okay to feel hurt, right? Uh, so during that time, for example, if there is a uh, grievance in the family, if there is some type of bereavement in the family, someone has passed away in the family, it is okay to withdraw from society. Right? And that is why the Prophet وسلم, he has said that we should only mourn for three days. After the third day has, has been done, then pretty much you go back to your normal life and you try to slowly get back in society. Now, when Ja'far uh, ibn Abi Talib, who, had, who was martyred in the Battle of Mu'ta, and when was the Battle of Mu'ta? I just said it. When was it? So after that, so Asma ibn ibn Umais, bint Umais, she was the wife of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Now Asma bint Umayyad bin Umais, she's a very interesting Sahabiya because she at one time was the wife of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Then at one time she was the wife of Abu Bakr Then she also was the wife of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So she is someone who is very prestigious, she has that rank with her. So when she became a widow, and she had the sons of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, right? And now these are the cousins of Hussein and Hassan radiallahu anhu. So when they were there, in, they came back in Medina, they were there actually in Medina. So the Prophet sallallahu he went to visit them. Now it is, it is the third day, the third day is over. And Asma, she was, you know, very heavily in grief, and she was pretty much shocked about the, getting the news that her husband had, had passed away. So the Prophet ﷺ, he went, and he told her that, you know, obviously for her, she will take her whole in the period, but at least for the children. The children had not even changed their clothes, and obviously their hair was growing out. So what the Prophet ﷺ did was that he went, he took them to the barber, he got them a haircut, and then he got them new clothes, right? And then, pretty much, it, for them, it was pretty much a day of getting out of the sadness of losing their father, you know? So when, even when the Prophet ﷺ went to him, he told him that, hey, your father is in the big uh, palaces of Jannah, because obviously a, sh a shaheed, he goes straight to Jannah, right? So he cheered them up, you know? He didn't go up to them and say, oh, you know, I miss your father, he was a very good man, you know, this and that. Always into a small child, we shouldn't be doing this to him, you know? Because that will make him cry even more when he remembers his father, right? So when we go to them, try to cheer them up, right? Tell them that, you know, may Allah forgive your son, may Allah forgive, you know, whoever has passed away, your father, this and that, and that he may be a gentleman for those and have this iman within you. 
Because when we go to any type of janazah, or when we go to any type of aza, any type of uh, event in which we are there to offer our condolences, we're not there to make the person even more sad, right? We're trying to go there, offer our condolences, and cheer him up. You know, boost him, give him that boost. Because obviously he's already not thinking about any other thing in this life. He's only thinking about the loss that he's taking right now. But we need to go up to them, cheer them up, give them that morale boost so that they're able to use that morale boost within their iman and to use that to come back into society, right? So that is where the mu'min has to have trust in Allah, right? That, and this also leads me to the fourth point, which is that no matter how severe, again, the seerah teaches us that no matter how severe the tragedy is, we must learn to move on and not become immobilized or stop in the dunya to strive for the akhirah. So, for example, you are going to somewhere, you're driving somewhere, and you go into a car accident. Okay, yes, it is a sad accident. So, obviously, you may be sad for maybe two days or three days. But after that, you need to begin to move on, right? You need to come back towards the masjid. You need to come back towards, you know, moving into life. And ask sincerely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you and give you the patience to move on, right? Just as when Yusuf salam was taken by his brothers, what did Ya'qub salam say? He said that, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ That may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me the, the most beautiful patience. And there was another very important statement that he said, which was that قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Right? He's saying that I only complain about my sadness and all of the, what I complain is only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Now imagine, let me go, to, go into this small tangent because it's very relevant too. Let me give you a, a good example. So this way it look much clearer. Let's say you have a son in your house, okay? So you have a son in your house, you buy him his clothes, you buy him whatever food he wants, you buy him the ice cream he loves from a shop right, or stop and shop or Walmart, right? He's happy. But whenever something happens, right? Like whenever he needs anything, he doesn't come to you, right? He never comes to you. Rather, he goes to some other random uncle in the masjid. And he basically keeps asking that uncle for whatever he wants. Now, you as a father, how will you feel? It's a question for those of us who are fathers here. Won't you feel, you know, like basically humiliated? Won't you feel that, you know, why is my son asking other people when I am here? You'll be like, I'm not here. Why are you going somewhere else, right? Isn't that the way you feel? You'll be like, yeah, go, go, go to somewhere else. Isn't that true? Yes, the fathers? That's true, right? So, think about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He creates, right? That when Aqadu khalaqna al-insana, Aqadu khalaqna al-insana, bi ahsan al-taqeem. He just recited this in, uh, in Salat al-Maghrib. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created all insan, all human beings, in the most perfect stature, right? Imagine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He, he was the one who made our parents the wasila to come into this world, right? Alhamdulillah, we were born into Muslim households. We grew up as Muslims. And then, when some small incident happens, we quickly turn away from Islam. We quickly turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We quickly turn away from even the masajid. And we say that, you know what, because of this small incident, I'm not even going to go to the masjid anymore. Astaghfirullah. Don't you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will feel that same feeling as I was just talking about recently, about the father and the son? Think about that, for example. So this comes to tell us that obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give these types of calamities as a wake-up call, right? And that is what, what we need sometimes, because we may... As you know, as we're in this rat race and pretty much just going into a small circle every single day, you know, just waking up, going to the Masjid al Fajr, then going to work, dropping the kids to school, coming back home, having dinner, going for Aisha, going to sleep. It's pretty much like a you know circle that we're going in. But when something happens to break that cycle, break that circle, that is when our eyes open up. And that is where it is very important that no matter how severe that tragedy is. We must learn to move on and that we are not becoming immobilized 
you know, within this dunya to strive for the akhirah. Now, this leads me to the fifth point, which is that there are specific ways and specific tactics from the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, which we learn to cope with stress and, tri- and these types of trials and anxiety. And the number one thing, so point number five, and then under five, you can have like, you know, five A. So the point five A would be, is salah, right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that, Ya ladina amanu, Ista'inu bis sabri wa salah. That oh, you will believe, basically use salah, use salah as a means to get through these different types of uh, trials and tribulations that we have. So, salat al hajjah right? Um, there was one person who I know that whenever he would get either good news or bad news, then he would always uh, get up and pray two rakats, whether it would be salat al shukr or salat al hajjah right? This was his. Uh, habit that he would do to basically ask Allah to beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so salah is a very important component 5b would be dua right dua is a very very important tool even such so much so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned that dua is actually the weapon of the believer and in, in other ahadith, it's mentioned that لا يرد القدر إلى الدعاء That your predestination, your qadr, your taqdeer can only be changed if you make dua for it, right? And another hadith, which is a very important one, which is, it is that uh, Both of these riwayat are mentioned in the books of hadith That dua, it is actually like the brains of ibadah It is actually like the most important aspect of ibadah, right? So, now when we come to dua, obviously for those of us who do know, you know, du'as in Arabic, we can make those du'as in our salah. But for those of us who may not know du'as in Arabic, it is fine, inshallah, after you complete your salah, you can ask du'a in your own language, right? So for example, if you are very fluent in Urdu, you can make du'a in Urdu outside of salah. If you're fluent in English, you can make du'a in English, right? Now this leads me to a small tangent, which I must mention, is that some people before, this is like, you know, back in like maybe 300 years ago, 400 years ago, in like the 1600s and 1700s, when people who, people who would live in India, and when the British came to India at that time, they were speaking English, right? So the people there, they would say that, oh, we should not speak English because it's, it's a language of the, uh, the Kuffar, because for them, they, they consider them Kuffar, so non-Muslims, so we should not be using that language. My dear respected brother or sister, subhanAllah, think about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who created all these languages. That it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created the heavens and the earth, and He also created the differences of all of our languages and colors. So whether it's English or Spanish or whether it's French or Dutch or you know it's German or Swedish or Urdu or Farsi or Hindi or you know all these languages they're all made from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we shouldn't be having this type of notion that you know dua should only be made in Arabic obviously yes in salah it should but outside of salah you should make, make dua in any language that you feel comfortable number two that I would mention with dua is be specific in your dua there was one brother, he was making a dua in one masjid and he said that, Oh Allah, if you want to give me a Ferrari, give it to me. But if you don't want to give it to me, then I'm fine. Don't, don't, don't give, give me a Ferrari. Astaghfirullah, what type of dua is this? Right? If you want a Ferrari, say, Ya Allah, only you are the one who can give me the Ferrari and give me the Ferrari. Say it like that, right? So be specific in our dua. That is the main point to take from today's lecture, inshallah ta'ala. That when we are asking for dua, be very specific. Now, if you want, this is like a small cheat sheet for du'a. The best way to ask du'a is always that you start off by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So like in various du'as, it is mentioned that, you know, as we say, that Allahumma anta fawthiru samawati wal ardi wa man fihin. Right? Wa lakal hamdu anta qayyumu samawati wal ardi wa man fihin. These are various ways of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another way would be, نسألك اللهم بأسماك الحسنى وصفاتك العلى. Right? These are some ways that we beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after you have done that, then you want to send some salam and, and you know, durood upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And then you begin to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever you are looking to ask for, right? So that is some, some things to mention in dua. Now, obviously, dua is a very, you know, vast topic which requires a separate lecture of its own, and you know, where to make it, how to make it. So then, inshallah, that can be covered some other day. So the next point, which is 5C. So the point 5C is that complain to only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You might have met some people, you know, somewhere, that when you meet them, you say, Assalamu alaikum, brother, how's it going? They're like, oh, brother, I can only complain. This is bad, that is bad, family is this, job is this. The guy starts a whole, you know, khutbah kind of, sort of, of just complaining about his life problems. This is not something which, you know, is from the believer. A mu'min is someone who doesn't, you know, show all of his faults to the people, who doesn't, you know, complain to the people. Rather, he complains to only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that is why, as it's mentioned in Surah Yusuf, that is why Yaqub alayhi salam said that I only complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't complain to you guys. He was talking to his sons over there. So 5D, this point is also a very important one. It is. So 5D is a combo, a combination of all these three, which is to pray Salat al-Tahajjud. Okay? Now, Salat al-Tahajjud, it is a very special prayer. It was a prayer which is actually mandatory for all of the Prophets, even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even when he was traveling, he would still have to get up at night time and pray uh, Salat al-Tahajjud. Now the question arises, why is Salat al-Tahajjud so important, right? Well, let me tell you. Let's say that you are going through stress, okay? Let's make it a marital problem, okay? So you're going through a marital issue, you're stressed out, you know, you're not really talking that much to your spouse, and you want to resolve the issue, right? The best thing that you could do, and again, today it's a Friday night, right? Friday night and Saturday night, these are good nights because it's, you know, you're off and you don't maybe have to go to work. So go, get up at maybe 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. and just only pray two rakats. Two rakats of Salatul Tahajjud. And after you're done with that salah, make your dua, right? After you're done with the salah, you raise your hands and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be specific. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, I'm going through this marital issue. I want you to resolve this issue and make my wife the love of my life, right? Obviously some people might be thinking, the love of my life, yes, she should become the love of your life. Because, you know, the spouse is something which is supposed to be near and dear to your heart. So make these du'as, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resolve the issue. And the most weird thing is, which is strange, which I would say is ajeeb, is that after you make your du'a, you're crying and you're you know, sobbing and weeping to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after you say ameen and you end your du'a, you're saying wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Muhammad and you end your du'a, a weird type of feeling comes in your heart. I'm not sure if you know, you probably you know, experienced that, but I personally have. That whenever you pray to Hajjah, then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever you want. And you say ameen to your du'a and you end. A weird type of sakina comes into your heart. A weird type of tranquility comes into your heart. That you know what? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the world, He has listened to my plea, you know, and the, my petition is accepted and now something will happen. Like there's that feeling, right? And there's a reason for that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has you know, said this through the Prophet wasallam. He said that at the time of the Hajjah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he comes down and he says that, هَلْ مِنْ سَائِنٍ فَعْطِيَهُ فَعْطَيْهُ That is, there's someone who would like to ask me anything, and I, I shall give it to them. هَلْ مِنْ مُسْتَغْفِرٍ فَاسْتَغْفِرَ لَهُ That is, for anyone who would like to basically seek forgiveness or anything, and so that I shall forgive them. هَلْ مِنْ تَعِبٍ فَأَتُوبَ عَلَيْهُ That is, anyone who would like to seek, who would like to make repentance, and make his tawbah to me, so that I shall, you know, accept his tawbah. So this comes to tell us that, you know, for those of us who are maybe high school or college students and we're trying to save up money to buy our first car, wake up for the Hajjud, man. Come on, wake up. Ask the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll basically, you know, give that listing to you in Facebook Marketplace when you're scrolling for maybe a Toyota Camry or Honda Accord and it might be a clean title, everything should be good. So you'll be able to buy it, right? So this is pretty much how the Seerah teaches us to deal with stress and anxiety. Now, another point that I personally wanted to mention, it is that when we are 
complaining and we're trying to, you know, looking, trying to look for outlets, we shouldn't be going and thinking about, you know, some people who are perceived as being righteous and that, you know, we start doing some type of uh, shift type of thing. Let me give you an example. So, like, for those of us who come from the subcontinent, it's very, you know, common to have this culture of going to, like, some kind of, you know, saint. That's what pretty much it can be translated as, like a peer song. So you go to that person, you tell them whatever your problem is, he does something, you know, some little abracadabra magic, and then you go out and your problem is, is, is over. So, what we should do, right, I'm not saying that basically to go to them is shirk is haram and this and that. What we should be doing is try our best and to make our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Obviously, for those people who go to different... And there are some of our own scholars who actually, if you go to them with, with your problem, they will prescribe you with some type of things to read and sometimes some, some things to do. And after some period of time, it does help, it does work with them. But what we need to realize is when we have any type of problem, we need to ask only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We shouldn't be saying that, you know, Ya Ahmad, Ya, ya Ali, you know, solve my problem, do this, do that. No, we do not go to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask them to solve our problems, no. Rather, we go to the creator of the problem, right? The creator who created the problem in the first place for his creation, and we ask him to solve our problem, right? So that is something that we need to really be careful of, that we're not going to, you know, other outlets, which may be, you know, pretty much associating partners with Allah. If you imagine, why did the Prophet ﷺ come in this uh, dunya? Why did he come to Quraysh and Mecca? Can anyone tell me? What were they involved in in Quraysh, in Mecca? Ibadat Aslam. Ibadat Aslam, yes, they were worshipping the idols, right? And he came to eliminate that. So if we are, you know, just like asking the phone or asking various things to solve our problems, it's something similar to that. So what we need to do is only beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what we need to do, right? That we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is another point. Now the last point in which I will finish for tonight inshallah ta'ala is that if we are going through a very severe, stressful situation, right? And if we are thinking like negative thoughts are coming right and left and like your life is very pretty much affected, then don't be shy to go to an expert. By expert, I mean either a mental health counselor, a psychiatrist, psychologist. We should be going out to them and seeking proper clinical help, right? <coughs> I know that this may be coming up as like a taboo for some of us, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, when you go to those trained people, and obviously if we have a Muslim who's a counselor, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> I personally know of some one brother uh, who is actually active, very active here in Central Jersey. He is going, he's on his way to become a mental health counselor. And he actually reached out to me and said that, you know, if there's anyone who needs some type of counseling, reach out to me. Because when you go to a Muslim counselor, he will not tell you that, you know, whatever you're going through, it's, you know, you should, you should be believing in God and this and that. Because pretty much that's what a lot, a lot of these psychiatrists they try to say. That whatever is going on is just whatever you're thinking and you shouldn't be you know, going to God and this and that. Because they don't have any relationship with religion, with deen. But if we go to a Muslim counselor, a Muslim psychiatrist, a Muslim psychologist, then they will be able to help us and guide us with the knowledge of religion as well. And that is very important. Because things happen, yes, we need some type, sometimes some place to vent it out, right? To basically tell all these things, inshallah ta'ala. So with that, I end for tonight, inshallah. If anyone has any Q&A with regards to any of the uh, points that I had mentioned, feel free to ask. If not, inshallah, we'll make dua and end for tonight. And it's also time for the event. So does anyone have any questions or we can stop for tonight, inshallah? Okay, inshallah. So we'll just make a very short dua and inshallah, we'll make the event for inshallah, inshallah. اللهم انت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم أعين على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتبع علينا إنك أنت التوب الرحيم واغفر لنا ولوالدينا ووالديهم ولجميع المسلمين الأحياء من المؤمنين Oh Allah, we ask you, we beseech you, Ya Allah, that whatever has been said today please allow us to understand it properly and Oh Allah, we ask you sincerely, Ya Allah that whatever has been said today allow us and give us the tawfiq and ability to act upon it and to really love the Prophet ﷺ, that we also 
Reunite with him, with his big palaces in Jannat al-Firdaus, and that we are able to be amongst those of the highest com uh, companionship of the Nabiyyin, the Siddiqin, the Shuhada, and the Salihin. O oh Allah, do not deprive us of drinking from the blessed hands of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the Hawdi Kawtham. O oh Allah, allow us to drink from there and quench our thirst and that we are able to get the mercy from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasafiru wa natubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayla khalqin wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya 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 rah